Well, we've been up all night. Um, I was looking out the window watching the children going to school, just thinking she might come back, probably, you know, ready to go to school. She'd stayed at a friend somewhere that we didn't know of. And um, police come to the door and asked us to sit down and just said, she's dead. We found her. The person you just heard was Kathleen Mann, mother of 15-year-old Linda Mann. It was November 21st, 1983, when Linda Mann went to her friend's house to babysit, but never made it back home. The following day, her lifeless body was discovered on Blackpad Road, Narborough, in the United Kingdom. Shockingly, three years later, on July 31st, 1986, another 15-year-old named Dawn Ashworth met a similar fate and was found dead at 10 Pound Lane in Enderby, Leicestershire. Two girls, two tragic deaths, and a mystery that would unravel with countless twists and turns. Who could be behind these horrifying acts? What secrets would be unveiled in Leicestershire's darkest chapter? Hello and welcome back to M7 Crime Storytime, where we cover solved, unsolved, and twisted cases from around the world. Today we'll take a look into the twisted case of Linda Mann and Dawn Ashworth. Without further delay, let's dive into the case. Leicestershire is a county located in the East Midlands region of England. It has an estimated population of around 1 million people. It's known for its rich history, diverse cultural heritage, and beautiful countryside. The county is home to the city of Leicester, famous for its historical landmarks. Leicestershire offers a blend of rural landscapes, vibrant cities, and a range of attractions, making it a captivating destination for visitors. Here, the crime rate is equivalent to 867 per thousand residents, putting it in the top 10 across the whole of England and Wales. It's here where our story begins. Linda Mann was born on July 30, 1968, in Narborough, Leicestershire. She attended Lutterworth Grammar School, growing up alongside her older sister, Susan Mann. Their mother, Kathleen Mann's first marriage, ended in 1978, but not much is known about that period. Kathleen married Edward Eastwood in 1980 when Linda was 12 years old. Linda was a typical teenager, loved by her peers, and enjoyed all the things that came with growing up. Music, hairstyles, makeup, and fashion. If she needed some extra money for clothes, she'd even babysit and make her own dresses. She had no idea that her happiness and extracurricular activities were about to come to an abrupt end. On the fateful afternoon of November 21st, 1983, 15-year-old Linda told her parents that she was going to babysit at a friend's house. She said her goodbyes and left with a promise to return home by 10 p.m. But as the clock struck midnight, there was still no sign of Linda. Her worried parents grew more anxious with every passing moment. They reached out to her friends, hoping to find out where she might be, but none of them had seen her. Determined to bring their daughter back safely, they embarked on a tireless search, scouring every street and every possible place she could have gone. However, their efforts yielded no results as there were no clues about her whereabouts. It was unusual because she was always very good, always on time, or she would let us know if she was going to be late. With their hearts heavy and no answers in sight, they made the difficult decision to contact the police and officially report Linda as missing. On the following day, November 22, 1983, as the sun began to rise, a hospital porter on his way to work made a startling discovery at 7.20 a.m. at a deserted footpath known locally as the Black Pad. He stumbled upon what he initially thought was a mannequin, but upon closer inspection, it turned out to be the lifeless body of a girl. Without wasting a moment, he alerted the police, who swiftly arrived at the scene. To their dismay, they recognized the victim as Linda Mann, the young girl reported missing just the night before. Well, we've been up all night... Um, I was looking out the window watching the children going to school, just thinking she might come back, probably, you know, ready to go to school. She'd stayed at a friend somewhere that we didn't know of. And um, police come to the door and asked us to sit down and just said, she's dead. We found her. Small communities, all leading a very, very normal life, law-abiding, good community people, and then suddenly this happens, this 
disaster in, within their midst happens. It was a lovely atmosphere, very village, very community. Um, everyone helped each other. If you needed a hand, you knew who to go to. This lane is uh, known locally as the Black Pad. It's used mainly by uh, people walking their dogs, pedestrians from Enderby and from Narborough. At that time of night, he was taking a chance because usually this lane is fairly well used by people. He knew that it was getting dark. Um, she was alone and the opportunity for him was there and that's why I took it. Determined to uncover the truth, authorities promptly sent the body for a thorough autopsy, hoping to find clues that would lead them to Linda's killer. Investigators searched the immediate area around the crime scene, but despite their best efforts, they were unable to uncover any useful leads or evidence. Curiously, just a short distance away from where Linda's body was found stood a local psychiatric hospital. Initially, police considered the possibility that the perpetrator might have been a patient who had escaped during the night and committed the heinous act. The thing that I was very anxious to establish was that it was unlikely to have been a psychiatric patient from the hospital. It was much more likely to be a man leading a normal life, perhaps with a, a family, uh, certainly one who had friends, relatives, and contacts who thought of him as a normal individual. However, upon thorough examination, it was revealed that the hospital had tight security measures in place and no patient had left during the previous night. This theory was ultimately ruled out due to a lack of supporting evidence. The news of the crime spread like wildfire through the peaceful town of Narborough, leaving its residents horrified. In an effort to enhance safety, young girls were strongly advised to walk in groups as a precautionary measure. I think young ladies should be very scared because we haven't found him, so we don't really know what's happening at all. It was a topic of discussion in every pub, on every bus, in every street, not just in the village of uh, Narborough or Littlethorpe or any of the areas around there, but across the whole of the county. As the investigation continued, the results of Linda's autopsy revealed some facts. It was the presence of male DNA on her body. However, back then, DNA technology was not as advanced as it is today, so they could only gather limited information. The DNA belonged to an individual with type A blood and with a PTM1 plus enzyme profile, which meant that approximately 10% of adult males in England could be the potential suspects. With such a large pool of potential culprits, every person became a suspect in the case. Meanwhile, a dedicated team of investigators went from door to door seeking any valuable information from the residents who might have witnessed something on the night of the murder. Simultaneously, Another group of investigators compiled a list of offenders involved in similar crimes in Leicestershire and proceeded to question each one of them. Just when investigators were grasping at straws trying to find any lead they could find, a mysterious phone call sparked new hope. The caller reported seeing a man with spiky hair near the location where Linda's body was discovered around 8 p.m. Unfortunately, the caller didn't provide any further details, leaving the investigators eager to gather more information. Determined to uncover leads, they revisited the crime scene and interviewed every resident in the vicinity, hoping to gather any sightings or clues about the person with spiky hair. Despite their best efforts, the investigators were unable to track down and identify the mysterious man with spiky hair. Linda Mann was buried in a churchyard close to where she was killed. During her funeral, the police took extra precautions and set up surveillance, recording the crowd to watch for anything or anyone suspicious. This was done because sometimes criminals return to the scene of the crime or engage in activities connected to the crime. The police wanted to ensure the safety of the mourners and gather any potential leads in the investigation. The police tried their best to gather information by issuing new posters of Linda Mann and hoping to jog people's memories, but unfortunately, it didn't provide much help. The investigation continued for months and even years, but there were no eyewitnesses, only a few promising leads and many false trails that led nowhere. The murder investigation seemed to have reached a dead end, and with no significant breakthroughs, the case went cold. Well, really in any police investigation, after a week or two, uh, the trail is usually cold. It's quite difficult. We suffer all the time. Yes, please come forward. It's always frustrating when uh, you know, you've not got an answer to a problem. And I mean, you're forever looking over your shoulder, A, to see what you've missed and then trying to guess what might happen in the future. Three years had gone by, 
and Leicestershire was slowly recovering from the shock of Linda Mann's murder. However, just when the county thought they could finally breathe at ease, another heart-wrenching tragedy unfolded. In the peaceful town of Enderby, Leicestershire, resided a young girl named Dawn Ashworth. At the age of 15, she shared a home with her parents, Barbara and Robin Ashworth, along with her younger brother, Andrew Ashworth. Dawn possessed a remarkable talent for drawing, showcasing her creativity and artistic skills to those around her. She had the opportunity, being in the newsagents, to buy every new magazine that was available. And um, this really was what her money went on, clothes and her look. And she was changing and blossoming, really, from day to day. It was July 31st, 1986, and Dawn left the house to visit her friend Sharon's house at 4.15 p.m. with a promise to return by 7 p.m. She strolled along Ten Pound Lane, a well-maintained and illuminated road that led to Narborough. As she continued on, the path approached the M1 highway, where it became narrower and eventually transformed into a trail. At this critical juncture, Dawn faced a decision. She could either turn left, crossing the motorway using the footbridge, and proceed along the radiator walks towards a dual carriageway, or she could continue straight ahead along the track. During late July, the lane would have been abundantly covered with tall summer plants and foliage, making it difficult to navigate. At 4.40 p.m., Don Ashworth walked past Edward Avenue, which marked the end of the 10-pound lane, and led to her friend Sharon's house. After reaching there, Don couldn't find Sharon, and she even asked her neighbors if Sharon was around, but she was nowhere to be found. After being unable to find Sharon, Don decided to take the shortcut back home through the densely overgrown footpath of the 10-pound lane. Dawn was expected to be back by 9.30 p.m., but when there was no sign of her, her parents grew worried. They drove around Narborough, hoping to spot their daughter along the way, but unfortunately, they couldn't find her. At 9.40 p.m., they made the decision to call the police and reported Dawn as missing. Interestingly, the same officers who had been investigating Linda Mann's case were assigned to Dawn's case as well. Here was a girl of the same age as Linda Mann, a girl on her own, going from A to B, and disappears. So consequently, we, um, we did treat it uh, with uh, a great deal of priority. The police made a plea to the public, urging anyone with information about Don Ashworth, or who may have witnessed anything unusual on July 31st, 1986, to come forward. They even spoke with Sharon to see if she had encountered Don that day, but she had no knowledge or information to provide. The search for Don continued, and after two days, on August 2nd, 1986, the police made a grim discovery. They found Dawn's lifeless body hidden under thick brush near Ten Pound Lane. We've got to find the fiend, really, that did this to my daughter, to our daughter, and um, stop it from happening again. Surprisingly, her body was found less than a mile away from where Linda Mann's body had been found three years earlier. The investigators found male DNA on Dawn's body, and it matched the blood type of the person who had killed Linda Mann. This led them to believe that the culprit could be the same for both cases. The similarities between the murders and the matching blood type connected the two cases and pointed to a single perpetrator. There were signature elements in the crime, certainly. Uh, both murders took place on footpaths. Both girls were uh, teenagers. Um, both girls were walking alone. Police launched an extensive investigation into the murder of Dawn. At the end of Ten Pound Lane, the police set up a mobile incident room where they gathered information from villagers and passers-by. They received about 200 phone calls and had numerous visitors to the mobile unit. One particular lead seemed promising and focused on a motorcycle that was seen parked under the motorway bridge. Several reports mentioned a young man wearing a red crash helmet in that area around 5 p.m. on the day of the crime. Now, it struck the police that on August 1st, 1986, a day after Dawn was reported missing, but before her body was found, a policeman and a detective had noticed a young man riding a red motorcycle and wearing a red crash helmet. They observed this individual showing interest in the search. What are you doing? We're looking for a girl. Buckland was going around telling people that the police were looking in the wrong area. He even told police officers looking for Dawn that they were looking in the wrong place. Take your helmet off. Buckland was a local lad who worked in the Sorry, hospital in Richard, Richard, what? Just stay there, Richard. There was something not right. The person was a 17-year-old kitchen porter, Richard Buckland, who worked at Carlton Haynes Hospital, 
a psychiatric hospital near the locations where Linda and Don's bodies were discovered. When questioned by the police, he claimed to have seen Don walking in the lane on the day she went missing, but had no information where she could be. Although the police didn't pay much attention to his statement at the time, they decided to speak to him again later to gather more information. The day after Don's body was found, Richard visited his friend's house at 10 p.m. He couldn't contain his excitement and shared the news that Don's body had been discovered near a gate by the M1 bridge, hidden in a hedge. The friend's father overheard their conversation and was curious to know how the porter had learned such specific information that hadn't been made public. When asked, Richard mysteriously replied that someone had told him. He went on to describe that Don's body had been hanging from a tree and was then concealed under tree branches and debris. She was found inside an access gate leading from 10 Pound Lane into a field, only a 10 minute walk from the M1 bridge. The friend's father found it suspicious, but at the time he dismissed the conversation, thinking that Richard may have spoken to someone connected to the police who had informed him about the discovery. However, days later, when he heard reports about people seeing a person on a motorcycle near 10 Pound Lane where Don's body was found, his suspicions grew. He remembered that Richard also owned a motorcycle and had provided unusual information that night. On August 8, 1986, he informed the police about his suspicions. After gathering all the information, the police became convinced that Richard was the person seen riding the motorcycle on the day of the murder. They wasted no time and decided to arrest him. We uh, weren't satisfied with his explanations and a decision was taken to arrest him. There was a sense of, thank God, you know, the man has been caught after all this time and this will hopefully put an end to it. Richards was taken to a Wigston police station for more questioning. He gave different and conflicting statements to the investigators, but he didn't admit to seeing Dawn on the day she went missing and speaking to her. At one moment, he confessed to everything, but soon after, he took back his confession. After enduring a challenging 15-hour interrogation, Richard eventually confessed to killing Dawn during his third interview. The police were relieved to have found the person responsible, especially considering the similarities between the two murders. They strongly believed that Richard was also involved in the murder of Linda Mann three years earlier. Even though Richard admitted to killing Don, he stubbornly maintained his innocence in the murder of Linda. The police were skeptical of his claims and were determined to uncover the truth. They sought assistance from Dr. Alec Jeffrey, a geneticist at the University of Leicester, located just a short distance from where both girls were tragically killed. Dr. Jeffrey had been studying inherited illnesses when he stumbled upon a groundbreaking technique known as DNA or genetic profiling. This discovery would prove to be a pivotal turning point in the investigation. David Baker said, well, look, let's cement the case against this young man. Let's go to this geneticist at Leicester University, this Dr. Alec Jeffries, and take the semen samples from both murders and cement our case with this new thing called genetic fingerprinting, whatever it is, and let's just prove that he did both of them because we know he must have done both of them. It would be the first time in a criminal case investigators used the new technique called DNA profiling to try and find out who committed the double murder. They wanted to know if Richard was truly responsible for both killings. My initial reaction was, well, yes, we will try, but don't hold out too much hope. Nobody's ever attempted this sort of analysis on relatively old, real forensic casework. Dr. Jeffrey tested the DNA of the victims, Linda and Don Ashworth, and discovered that they were both indeed attacked by the same man. Then he conducted a test on the type A DNA, which was recovered from both victims' bodies to Richard's DNA. That's where the surprising twist emerged that no one expected. The DNA didn't match Richard's DNA. What about the prime suspect, Richard Buckland? This is his blood DNA profile here and here, completely different from the semen profile. Conclusion, both girls have been raped and therefore presumably murdered by the same man, and that man was not the prime suspect, Richard Buckland. Which meant he was not the one who killed Dawn, and he also didn't kill Linda. It was, it was a blow to us. They didn't, basically didn't believe a word that we were saying, and that was quite right healthy skepticism of, of an entirely new technology. And indeed, I didn't believe the results myself, so we did retesting. The testing was done, again, independently by home office forensic scientists, all pointing to the same conclusion, namely that Buckland was not the guilty party in this case. The police were shocked by the results because they were sure Richard was the killer. But now, they were back to the beginning with no leads. 
After spending four months in custody, Richard Buckland was released and made history as the first person in the world to be proven innocent of murder through DNA profiling. However, a puzzling question remained. Why did Richard confess to a crime he didn't commit? According to Richard, he felt immense pressure to catch the real killer quickly because the murders were terrifying the community. Then the pressure started getting really hard. He just didn't have a chance. So he falsely confessed to the crime, hoping it would bring back a sense of normalcy to the people. However, after DNA evidence proved his innocence, Richard was no longer considered a suspect. The investigation into the double murder continued as the authorities now had to find the true culprit. Meanwhile, Don Ashworth's funeral took place at Enderby Parish Church in Leicestershire on Thursday, August 28, 1986. Many people from the community attended to show their respects and remember the moments they shared with Don. Inspector Derek Pierce was appointed to lead the investigation in 1987. He diligently went through 1,800 messages sent by the public, searching for any valuable leads. One particular message caught his attention. It mentioned an individual without an alibi who had a history of indecent exposure. The message urged the police to investigate a man in Littlethorpe. Since there were numerous individuals without alibis in the area, the investigators decided to explore a new approach. They pondered the potential of DNA evidence and whether they could match the individual's blood type to the evidence found at the crime scene. The first ever DNA manhunt began in January 1987, and the police took a unique approach. They sent letters to all men between the ages of 13 and 33 residing in the villages of Narborough and Enderby. The letters requested their voluntary participation in a blood and saliva test. The purpose of the DNA testing was to identify those individuals who shared the same blood type as the killer, which accounted for approximately 10% of the population. The goal was to narrow down the suspects and apprehend the guilty party. Surprisingly, thousands of men from the villages willingly provided blood samples, all in an effort to capture the person responsible for the murders of the two schoolgirls in Leicestershire. Not at all, no. I think the uh, person responsible might have. After conducting the tests, only a quarter of the thousands of men were cleared of suspicion. The forensic laboratory was overwhelmed with the large number of samples, and it became evident that the testing process would take longer than the initial estimated time frame of two months. By May 1987, a total of 3,653 men had undergone the tests, but due to the heavy workload faced by the laboratory technicians, only 2,000 individuals had been eliminated from the investigation. It was a slow process. I mean, we'd started in the January, and of course we're now into July, August. And, and I mean, we're still taking samples, and we're still having uh, samples processed. So, I mean, you know, we didn't know whether there was one in the system from the samples that we'd already taken. On September 18, 1987, the police received a phone call that would change everything. As it turned the whole investigation upside down, challenging the investigators for the further twist. It was a woman who had crucial information to share, information that could unravel the mysteries and reveal the truth behind the murders. I was in the um, murder incident room when the call came through. It was a breakthrough, if you like, that we in fact were waiting for. It was good information. Nobody could make that kind of information up. We knew when that information came that uh, if that was the case, there was um, something not uh, not quite right. She shared that she and her co-workers had gathered at a local pub during their day off, and Ian Kelly, a fellow bakery worker, had joined them. As they discussed the ongoing DNA manhunt, she overheard Kelly bragging about taking the blood test meant for Colin Pitchfork. This raised suspicions in her mind because it seemed unusual for someone to willingly take another person's test, regardless of their fear of the police. Recognizing the significance of this revelation, she decided to contact the Leicestershire Murder Inquiry team, leading them to focus their attention on Colin Pitchfork. The police wasted no time and quickly located Colin to question him about the blood test and his knowledge of the two murders. As it turned out, Colin became the last person to take a blood test in the murder investigation. The DNA analysis confirmed what everyone expected. Colin was a perfect match. And then they took the pattern on film from Pitchfork compared it with semen recovered from the victims and showed that, the, that these complex patterns matched up. Colin faced intense interrogation, realizing he'd been caught with no way to escape. Within a short time, he confessed to the killings of both Linda Mann and Don Ashworth. He admitted that he already had a criminal record and was known to the police for previous convictions, including indecent exposure. 
He'd been desperate to avoid further involvement with the police, so he convinced his co-worker Ian Kelly to take the blood test on his behalf. Since Kelly lived outside the area and wasn't asked to take the test himself, he seemed like the perfect cover for Colin. Pitchfork spun him a yarn that um, he'd already given blood on behalf of somebody else who uh, couldn't go because he was wanted by the police, etc., etc. And uh, Kelly ostensibly swallowed that hook, line and sinker. So when Ian Kelly took the blood test on behalf of Colin, among the more than 5,000 men who voluntarily provided blood and saliva samples, it didn't match with Colin's DNA at the crime scene. This allowed Colin to avoid suspicion and escape being caught at that time. Colin Pitchfork was born on March 23, 1960, in Newbold, Verdon, and attended school in Market Bosworth and Desford. He was 21 years old when he got married to Carol Pitchfork, a social worker in 1981. They had two children together. Unfortunately, Carol had no knowledge that she was married to a serial killer. I think he was able to deceive her perfectly well so that nobody in the whole world knew that he was the guilty person. It's the same story. Uh, the wife, the brother, the mother, the friends of serial killers never suspect that they could be serial killers. Before getting married, Colin Pitchfork had committed indecent exposure and had to undergo therapy at Carlton Hayes Hospital in Narborough. He'd been working as an apprentice at Hampshire's Bakery in Leicester since 1976 until his arrest for the murders. In 1979, Colin forcibly assaulted a girl in a field. Then in October 1985, he assaulted another girl, threatening her with a screwdriver and holding a knife to her throat. Now, it was time for justice to be served for all his crimes. On January 22, 1988, Colin Pitchfork faced trial at the Crown Court in Leicester. During the trial, Ian Kelly was found guilty of conspiracy to obstruct justice. He received a sentence of 18 months in prison, but it was suspended, meaning he didn't serve any time behind bars. I was wrong for doing what I did. Colin admitted his guilt for the two murders, as well as the assault of two other girls and conspiring to obstruct justice. He was the first person to receive a life sentence using DNA profiling as evidence. He was sentenced to life imprisonment for the murders and 10 years for the assaults. Additionally, he received three years for each count of assault and three years for perverting the course of justice, with all sentences to be served at the same time. A psychiatric report described Colin as having a psychopathic personality disorder. The Lord Chief Justice stated that for the safety of the public, there were doubts about whether he would ever be released. The Secretary of State said a minimum term of 30 years, which was later reduced to 28 years on appeal in 2009. On June 7, 2021, Colin was granted conditional release from prison. However, the Secretary of State for Justice, Robert Buckland, requested a review of the decision, and Colin remained in custody while the review was conducted. On July 13, 2021, it was reported that the review had been denied, meaning Colin would be released. He was ultimately released on September 1, 2021. In November 2021, Colin was sent back to prison for violating the conditions of his release by approaching young women while on walks from his bail hostel. It's important to note that he didn't commit any new crimes during this time. In June 2023, it was announced that Colin would be released on parole once again. This decision received significant criticism from the public. Barbara Ashworth, the mother of Don Ashworth, expressed her strong disapproval of Colin Pitchfork's release. She said, It was known that he'd be released, but I believe he shouldn't be allowed to breathe the same air as us. She firmly believed that Colin, who admitted to the murders of both girls, deserved to spend the rest of his life in prison because of the heinous crimes he committed. She added, he did much more than just the murders. Her words highlight the deep pain and anger felt by the victim's families and the belief that Colin should have received a life sentence without the possibility of parole. I think we've learnt a lot from the deaths of both of these two girls. Certainly the scientific advances that um, have been made with um, DNA has uh, spread itself now throughout uh, the world. It was this case of all cases where, on, on which DNA really cut its teeth in a forensic sense. The door has been opened to a whole new aspect of uh, medical investigation. People will be talking about this case a hundred years from now, not because of my book, but because of Alec Jeffrey's discovery. What are your thoughts on this case? Does Colin Pitchfork deserve to be paroled? We'd love to hear from you. If there's a case you'd like us to cover, don't hesitate to drop your recommendations in the comment section below. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel for more captivating true crime stories. Until next time, stay safe 
and keep your eyes peeled for the next mystery to unfold.